Um, we're going to go right to the prayer. And I'm going to ask the Joneses, Chris and Francesca, if you guys do not mind unmuting yourself. And one second, we're going to, I'm going to ask you to lead us in this opening prayer. Um, and we'll do this at the front end. So that's good because I don't have it memorized. So thank you for why not. I expect you to translate it to Aramaic. Big expectations. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, together we proclaim that you are love itself. We acknowledge that your love holds us in existence. We proclaim that our marital relationship is the very fabric of your love. Today again, we receive the powerful grace flowing from our sacramental marriage flowing from your very heart while you were dying on the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, together with confidence, we bring to you every struggle, difficulty, and challenge. We recognize in these your hand molding us for sainthood, the opportunity to sacrificially pour ourselves out for the good of one another, always, without counting the cost, without reservation, that we might become like you. Lord Jesus Christ, together we recognize that our marriage and family is the primary target of Satan adversary in your name we renounce all his lies and whispers that in any way has held us held or holds us captive that in any way has influence right now in your holy name the name of jesus through the powerful intercession of our blessed mother mary who crushes his head we break his chains definitively completely lord jesus christ together in this very moment we humbly avail our souls anew to you In this very moment, we pray that you flood us with an abundance of your holy presence, that the authenticity of our faith will constantly shine through ready forgiveness, apology, and pursuit of your magnanimous love. Lord Jesus Christ, together we thank you for the amazing gift you give us in one another, in every way, the opportunity to attain holiness, to become what we are in you, to become saints. Today, again, we reclaim and declare our marital identity and mission to make you who are love known. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the name of Jesus, we do magnify that prayer that the enemy's influence be renounced. And we discover the nature of the Trinity, who we are in the nature of the Trinity, the nature of this love, which can God wants to restore. He wants to revive. He wants to take us to a new level. So the first week, of course, is on truth. It's the foundation. It's under attack. And we declare again, truth is not something we can presume to determine. Truth is someone who determines us. From that, we had Father Cromley. Hand in the air for Father Cromley, right? Last week, did he not bring it? He was awesome. So response. Every truth or revelation demands a response of either acceptance or rejection. And together we're here, hopefully receiving all the more of that truth. The other facet that we're going to talk about tonight that we're going to hear tonight, Melody Lyons speak about and so blessed to hear her and share this is incarnational. It's not just up there in the clouds. We're not angels. We are uh, limited. We have struggles. We inherit Uh, impairment, impediments from our background, our sin, things that we um, experience from others, things we've done ourselves, we discover that through this process of of sanctification, ever greater uh, approximation to his heart, we can uh, discover him in everyday life. So, Steph, do you want to introduce our amazing guest? Melody and her husband, Chris, who's a fire chief um, in Bayville. Thank you. So, we've known for many, many, many years, uh, even before we started dating believe it or not and it was actually at melody and chris's wedding my big claim to fame of connection here that greg and i had our first kiss 30 years later yeah so anyway um so melody is an amazing amazing woman which you will soon hear incredible wife and mother of nine children um and one grandchildren she's an author of the sunshine principle and an awesome book on natural catholic healing i'm going to see how many times i can use the word awesome when i'm describing melody here i follow very few blogs that there's so many out there that are great and good um and she is one of the very few uh, if only one that i check in with um deliberately and it's called the essential mother.com i think 
Is that right, Melody? Um, so check her stuff out there. And she is also, uh, we, we kind of entered the ranks together for the first time as grandmothers very recently. So congrats to you and Chris, Melody. Um, so I'll let her kind of take it from there, but just so blessed to have such an authentic witness who's not afraid to speak the truth, who's not afraid to speak the truth in love and um, just a real inspiration to so many. She's an incredible presence. Um, in the social media realm that I know many people look to and, and deliberately seek out to just um, be affirmed in truth and to kind of process things with. So without further ado, the beautiful Melody Lyons. Welcome, Melody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. That was really, <laughs> it was really affirming, very sweet. Um, I'm so grateful and happy to be here with you. Can you hear me? Okay. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm just gonna dive right in with the incarnational. I'm so excited, you know, when you presented this to me that every aspect of our ordinary lives are components of a custom design retreat meant for ever deeper encounter and conformity to Jesus Christ. And you know, um, when you first presented that, Greg, I was just like, <laughs> I just sat with that for just, oh, well, I've been sitting with that for weeks, but, God is accessible, life is sacred. And last week, Father Nathan talked a little bit about how the world has prevented us from staying in the womb, right? Like he said, the womb is gone, we're exposed now. And that's so true, but it's also the perfect segue to this week because it's also true that God has created family to be a womb, if you will, you know, to be that custom design retreat where we are made strong to face the world. And um, as I said, ever since you presented this idea, this idea of home as a custom design retreat has just been captivating me. So it's been rolling around. <laughs> it's, it's like one of those things that I've come to know over 25 years of marriage, like home as a place of encounter, peace, healing, and restoration. But having it represented to me that way just made me gasp a little with awe. A good retreat experience is one where you go in expecting God to work through the obvious things, like the apparent good, right? Which surrounds you, the prayers and community and food, sacraments and talks and, you know, to which you've given your initial yes and your entry fee. But the profound retreat experience is where you go in expecting a consolation and you end up just like stripped down to your core, <laughs> coming face to face with self and sin and darkness and doubt and then god you know and that's where this retreat analogy with the home and the family just blew me away and the first memory that came to my mind was of this silent retreat i went on it was 18 years ago and i had no cell phone we didn't own a cell phone but during that retreat there was this huge snowstorm it was so creepy and crazy because all the electricity went out it was this big drafty retreat center, really dark. Like the only light was these exit signs and very cold and I couldn't sleep at all. And we're all in these separate rooms and alone. And it just turned out to be this epic interior battle. It was, which culminated in finding the glowing red sanctuary light in the chapel, indicating the Eucharistic presence of my Lord Jesus Christ. So it was just really profound. And what occurred to me with that memory, though, is that today, if I went today, it would be different, you know, like a little less insulated. I would totally have my phone. And the first thing I would do in the darkness is I would be texting home. <laughs> I would be on the phone with Chris like, this is really creepy. You know, talk me through it, which isn't a bad thing, but it's just different. And so that memory came to me first when thinking of home as a God designed retreat where we arrive expecting consolation and we do get that, but we also come face to face with our sinfulness and this darkness of the night, the weakness of others, the isolation, even within community, there is a settling of the sediment on retreat, which my dear friend Brooke Taylor likes to say, and maybe a craving for escape, you know, at least from our own darkness. And always now we have that little button that we can press to keep us just on the surface and from surrendering the heart so fully to Christ through the vocation of home, which is the way to true liberation. So we want to go there. So if we are the retreat leaders in our home, one key to being successful in this role is to create an environment in which your attendees 
your children, your spouse are safe and supported enough to be able to like just totally hit the skids without losing themselves in the darkness. And I think that's the most beautiful part of this analogy, that as spouses and parents, we understand that the painful burdens we undertake to protect our home are providing that security for those we love. We let go of that resentment today, now, and enter in, leaning into our cross. We can't remove it. You know, we can't remove the crosses from the people in our homes, from, from, the, from their shoulders. But we can hold that space to retreat from the world and have a place where all is oriented towards divine love. And I have to bring this up. You already brought this up, but I'm a first time grandma and I'm still like just so excited. <laughs> I'm just bursting with this. Um, so my beautiful granddaughter was born on Ash Wednesday, which was like, it was so liturgically perfect because it was this pretty traumatic labor in birth, born on Ash Wednesday in the three o'clock hour after honestly a very, very intense trial of a year. And she was born at 316, you know? So that comes into me, I'm like 316, John 316, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, <laughs> that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And it just was incredible. Like God is so attentive to those little love notes, just the sacred details and the healing in our lives. And I marveled at this little irrepressible alleluia of her life, even on this solemn day, even during Lent, this precious thread of hope and praise runs confidently through it all. And the truth about Lent and about the Christian life is that we walk the Via Dolorosa, but it never does go completely black for us. And home should be that pinpoint of light, even during our Lent, and we should be pointing persistently to that light. So a little backstory um, about me. I've been married to my husband now for almost 26 years, married when I was 19 and he was 24 and up against, you know, a fair amount of skepticism about our ability to thrive and my age and whatnot. And I just, I credit my husband, Chris, for being what I see, I, I, I think in images. And so he's a load bearer and a beam holder. And this is how I see him. So those times when there's like a threatened collapse in our gold mine or maybe our little holy family cave. And he's in there like, you know, big John, like holding these fallen beams and earth away from his vulnerable little family. He, and he's standing there with a strain and a sweat and shaking and the veins popping out of the forehead and arms, you know, and beneath him, his family is secure and at peace. And it was through his modeling that I learned how to be something of that for our family as well, like in my own way. I'm not a load bearer like that. I don't have his particular strength. And it took me a while to awaken to his silent stand of prayer and effort because it seemed in some ways effortless. But now I see that my own strength, the image I have for me is more like a, a doula at the labor of a birthing woman. And I am a doula. <laughs> so this picture comes alive for me, just being present for the dynamic unfolding of the precious life and identity of family. Being at the heart of this dramatic pain and birthing where it just seems dark and overwhelmingly painful. And, but more than anything else, like I can't take away that pain for the people in, in my care, but I can hold that peace in the sacred space for this little family in travail. I can hold that space. You are safe. You are strong. You are held in him. You are capable. You are living mission. You will suffer, but you will rise. And you are free and safe to bring forth life. So that is broken when we allow the world to encroach without a righteous reason. And we all have, you know, these unique crosses within our homes. Um, one of my particular crosses has been chronic illness, which honestly has stripped me down to nothing at times, you know, in the pattern of the best possible retreats <laughs> and with the best possible outcome, I hope. Um, but this stripping down has forced me to face this painful things in life, which distractions and ability and strength 
often prevent me from really being able to engage in. You know, they provide an escape from the deep work that has to be done. So during particularly hard times, I've been stripped of my ability to care for my family, uh, relationships stripped of consolations, stripped of vanity when my disease made me pretty outwardly ugly and just very unappealing, uh, stripped of strength of body and all successes, uh, stripped of friendships that could not be maintained, of community, of the ability to read and even to pray. So there was one day when I laid on my bed and I thought, that I was probably going to die soon. Like I couldn't see my way. I couldn't see another outcome. And there was a clarity that God allowed me to have that this realization that he was allowing me to be stripped, even of control at the end, I was just too tired and sick. Like in my imagination, I had this romantic vision of what I would do if I ever had like this lengthy, you know, deathbed scene. I would be writing letters to my children or maybe doing videos, spending time with them slowly and lovingly releasing. And, you know, that was all pride. But the reality is that I didn't have the ability to do any of that. If I died, it would have been with all of my unfinished business left behind. Every word, action, outpouring, that was it. And I lay there and I'm like, that's it. I, I got nothing. Everything behind me is it. And I was really too tired to even be upset about it, which is just, it, it was a unique experience, but it did settle deeply within me. And it stayed there. It was planted as a seed. And over time, you know, my body was slowly restored to health. I had recovery. And I felt this seed just rising and growing in me. Like it has, it's not left. I haven't forgotten. And a commission with it, which is familiar to all of us because we're all Christians and it's just the mission of our lives that everything that we do should be oriented to the love which compels us, right? Not box checking, but that Christ should be made known to my family through my life. And this is what I want to leave. I mean, death's coming. It's coming again. Um, and this is what I want to leave when it does come. So I understood much better through that how my husband had just been undergoing his own lo load bearing. Just that sweating, straining, painful lifting so that I would be held and safe to be able to walk my Calvary with some measure of clarity. So I want to issue a challenge to you today to invite the Holy Spirit in to help illuminate what is distracting you from God and each other. I mean, it's all kinds of things. We know that. So that in the retreat of your life, you can go along with your children to be safe, to, to help them to be safe, to become who God created you to be and also hold that space for it, for them to be and your spouse, everyone within your home. So the challenge now is to wake up once again, you know, to this extraordinary life of spousal life, love, this wild adventure that just makes our lives, your lives, a fire of grace. We have a lot of mundane in our lives, a lot of struggle, and the deep work of holding that space isn't always pleasing to our appetites, right? So the more in love you are, the more capable of pain you are. Praise God. We get to do this, right? And the more necessary it is to invite the presence of Christ to transform, that's what Lent is for, the surrender, the weakening so that we can be made strong in him. And I, I do recall the first time I panicked in my marriage and I thought, oh, crud, <laughs> like, they were right. All the naysayers were right about my marriage. I'm, I'm too young for this. You know, I probably should have stuck with college sports instead of having babies. So I spent, you know, like a full two minutes looking for the escape hatch to committed marital love, which was supposed to be comfort and instead was cross. But when you're Catholic and you're married, you can't, you know, vows are simply shrugged off as a folly of youth. So we cling. Um, and maybe you've all had a similar experience where you see families in your communities tumbling down around you. And it's terrifying when you begin to stumble on your own beloved and yourself and the drudgery in our own community in the last two years, we have seen the disintegration of so many seemingly strong families. And frankly, it totally shook me. 
you know, the first one came and I was like, oh my goodness, that's really difficult to wrap my mind around. That's, that's really grievous. And then two and then three and then four and then five. And I was just shaken to my core, weeping at night, afraid, you know, like if this can happen to them, can it happen to me? Am I going to wake up in the morning and find it just all falling apart? So Chris and I have done some deep work in order to shore up our retreat walls. I told them I felt like our marriage was strong, but that I was afraid because I thought that they were strong too. So to become captivated again, we have to learn that what we expected at the start was not good enough. We need to go deeper. When did the radical call of 1 Corinthians and the gospel become a placard on the wall and a box checking instead of a flame? The suffering places of life are just this massive gift, allowing us to see that God's vision is deeper and wider. It's all in the sacred details. Marriage is a battle. It's a fire. It is a sunset in an ocean. It is rapids and cliff diving and wonder wrapped up in the tedious nitpicking mundane cross carrying struggle. And in these wicked times, especially, you know, we've got to remember, we've got to remember how to share the beautiful secrets with our spouses again and make our homes holy, chasing vigorously after it, like with youthfulness the special wink, the familiar touch, bring those back. The ixus drawn in the sand for each other while the world encroaches. You know, that secret, shared, sacred knowing. Beloved, you are extraordinary, my Lenten alleluia. And someday we will dance in eternal glory. We can dance tonight in anticipation, but first we do the dishes, you know, or maybe the dishes can wait. But we need to reclaim the space in our homes so that it can become that God-designed space of constant encounter. Everything pointing to the full truth and goodness of life now and eternally. If we're dancing, let it not be to something profane. If we're watching, why are we watching something that takes our eyes off of our beloved and can possibly dull that spark? We've got to fight for it. It's not work for the faint of heart. That's what sacramental graces are for. But we also have to get really practical about it and dig in. Get up, people of God. This is your adventure. And this is how I talk to myself <laughs> and how as spouses, you know, how I ask my husband to talk to me and he does. And we speak to each other because we don't want to forget. So I want to leave you with an outline for recovering joy in the home in the midst of our Lent, because Lent does not exclude joy. We need to hold that retreat space in our homes, open the door to grace, to healing, to flourishing. So I want to loosely cover what Father Alfred Delp calls the five conditions for true joy. And Father Delp was a priest in Nazi Germany who was arrested, imprisoned, and finally executed. While he was in prison, he wrote on tiny scraps of contraband paper with his wrists chained like this. And those writings were smuggled out of prison in a laundry cart. So when he wrote about joy, I, I mean, he, he wrote about joy that rises up out of literal torture, bloodied wounds, dungeons, isolation, terror, hunger, and depression, which are all things he experienced. So if we have a cross to carry, and this is why I go back again and again to Father Delph. Um, he could probably relate in some way. And when he wrote the, true, the conditions for true joy, he meant that these conditions are necessary for our liberation, not outside of our pain, but within it, even the most hopeless and grievous conditions. So this is where we have to go with our marriages. He battled every minute of his last years with the brokenness of spirit, of mind, of body, of grief for his people, um, and yet he wrote of joy. So I encourage you actually to read his writings, uh, the one book, Advent of the Heart, with Ignatius Press. And please forgive my liberties I'm taking with his <laughs> words. But here are the five conditions for true joy with my commentary, not his. So the first condition is holiness and nearness to God. The pursuit of union with Christ must be compelling every action of our lives. 
the interior of our home needs to reflect that love. It is not enough to do the box checking, okay? Went to mass, did the novena, made a green cake for St. Patrick's Day, abstained from meat. Those things are really good, but without the fervent pursuit of closeness to the person of Christ and a strong interior life, our piety could take us into very bad places, could completely fool us into thinking we're closer than we are. God is not a bean counter. He is a lover. His laws are in place to serve love. So what do we have to do in our homes to draw closer to him? What roofs do we have to dismantle? What do we have to cut out? When will we start to speak his name easily with others and become transformed and responsive? So we start doing that with our next condition for true joy, which is clarity and honesty. And this is hard because... To put it bluntly, uh, one hard fact about Christian life is that piety is so easily faked. And we know this. I mean, we, we can like we can have mortal sin on our souls and still walk around talking about Jesus. You know, we can fake other people out and ourselves. And it's just like really hard work to strip the veneer until our insides match our outsides and our outsides match our insides. There are so many prominent Christians who have preached the word of God with passion who at the same time have been enslaved by sin and lost their belief. It's everywhere. And it just takes really deep honesty to be free. And many of the families who have been leaders in our communities and whose marriages have disintegrated, and I'm not calling anybody out. These are things that are just known and we have to deal with them in order to process it and like recover our own families. A lot of those families are covering deep dysfunction with a pious veneer. So how do we protect our marriages against this? And the first step is to take it down, to take it down. We have to run to, recklessly to Christ boldly so that we can surrender our families to his healing power unhindered to freedom. So Father Delb's third condition for true joy is selflessness and readiness to serve. Everything in Christian life is oriented toward love. Everything, there are no exceptions the diaper changing, the sports practices, the intimacy, when we see Christ, he'll compel us to serve. So that means no more resentment over the mundane tasks of marital love and familial life. We're done with that. That's it. Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to serve. Thank you for this opportunity to clean up a hallway of kid vomit for the pain of relational struggle for other. Like if not me, then who? Thank you, Lord, for putting me here so that I can serve. It's hard, but thank you. So the fourth condition for true joy is detachment. When we go into the heart of our families, we should do so with detachment. And that does not mean coldness. Detachment from an unholy relationship with things, people, circumstances, ego, desire for praise, emotions, basically any outcome other than Christ. Father Delp writes this about detachment. With the knowledge of God's redeeming freedom, man releases himself from the unmediated relationship to things and conditions. He finds himself at a holy and healing distance, and the voice of such a person is not so quickly silenced. So detachment will make us bold in the defense of our families. And there's just a lot to unpack there in the context of marriage and family. I, you will all like, I just encourage you to go through that. You know, I know I'm not really strong enough to be wholly detached. I really like a lot of things like cheesecake and sleeping in and being right. Um, so my realistic goal is to make my idols so small that when Christ comes to liberate me, I can let them go by his grace. And I really recommend, um, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis wrote a work of fiction called The Great Divorce. And it's just an excellent slim volume um, to, to work on further reflection on detachment. Uh, but unholy attachments just blind us. They keep us from really surrendering our lives to goodness. So we got to root them out and subject them to the gaze of Jesus Christ where they can be purified. So the fifth condition for true joy, according to Father Delp, testimony, praise, and hope. In Thessalonians 5, 
Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This isn't optional. It's not optional. We don't set it aside for Lent either. One of the best practical uh, pieces of advice I have ever received was that we should write and speak in a way that advertises truth to ourselves. So when you repeatedly say to yourself, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm tired, I'm lonely, I'm afraid, I'm hurting, I'm sick, I'm lost. Well, those things are true sometimes, right? Or um, we're broken, we're unhappy, we're struggling, we're grieving. They're true, but they're not the full truth. And that's the key. We need the full truth. I am what? I am who? You know, who am I? My name is Melody. I'm made in the Imago Dei, the image of God. I was created to love and be loved now and for eternity. My inheritance is liberty and joy. Blessed be God forever. So if you're going to be a Christ follower, then you're going to give testimony to the world, not just others, but to yourself as well. So, you know, we need to listen to the words of the Psalms, the great hymns, and even the wonderful contemporary songs of praise, which I love. Bring them into your home. They all have the same message. The message is, I was lost and broken, Lord, but you rescued me. I am wandering, but you'll find me. I'm afraid, but you are my consolation and hope and courage. So our mission here is to bring the incarnational truths into your home to transform them. Speak truth and hope into the darkness. Even if you think nobody hears you, the Lord hears you, your spouse hears you, your children hear you, and you hear you. Proclaim it endlessly, even in the midst of pain. So we struggle, but we praise you. During sickness, we praise you. During health, we praise you. In poverty, we praise. In affluence, we praise. In better times, we praise. In worse times, we praise. In new life, we praise. In death, we praise. Let our lives and homes be a respite and a stronghold, a thread of hallelujah through every Lent. Amen, and thanks be to God. Melody, standing ovation. Just experience it. We are so grateful for you. You are the sound of heaven to our ears. It's a very beautiful but challenging message. Welcome back. We're um, quick announcement, and we'll pray. And then those who want to interact at all with Melody and ask any questions, you're welcome to do so. We want to land, though, pretty quickly here. So journeying deeper into the Trinity. And um, I encourage you to keep praying that prayer. It's a little longer, the marriage prayer, um, because it is just such an occasion for a, together a spouse, couples rediscovering who they are in Christ and renouncing the enemy and walking in the full anointing and appointing of our Lord. So as much as you can, we encourage you to pray that prayer. So um, let's see here. Who can I grab? Jason and Jeanette, why don't you lead us in this daily parent blessing each of you can take a paragraph and we'll join you you're muted right now but we'll close with that in the name of the father son and the holy spirit amen amen, amen. All right lord jesus christ let your holy anointing be upon each of our children grandchildren and godchildren this day and in your sacred name we claim them for you we renounce all whispers and lies influencing the enemy we pray right now that each of you know your loving presence be forged in virtue and we be flooded with an abundance of your Holy Spirit to fully live in their identity and mission in you now and through all eternity. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, Son, and the Thank Holy you. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Next week, Peter Herbeck and Debbie Herbeck, the dynamic dual couple, and we get to end natural. I'm very excited to process that with him.